Hello. Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm so, I thank you very much all for being here tonight because this is such a, a very, very meaningful thing for me and for the musicians involved in this wonderful enterprise. I had the great fortune of meeting Deborah Ayers, who is the head of Montage Music Society, um, several years ago because she was um, supporting and promoting and commissioning, helping commission our friend Bruce Wallisoff in his work, in his composing work. And you probably, I think probably almost everybody here has heard him play here at the church and it's wonderful. And then um, I was thrilled when she suggested that maybe I could do something as a kind of a synesthetic collaboration with a guy whom I didn't know named Niles Luther. And Niles Luther is a wonderful young classical contemporary composer, the oxymoron of our times. And he um, and I spent a weekend, not really, I mean, we, we talked about art, we talked about music um, the whole time. I had a painting that I had begun working on that I was excited about, which is the painting behind me called Light Bending the World. I mean, belatedly, that's what I ended up titling it. But I, I said to him, I was doing working on this painting. I was sort of excited about it, maybe because I couldn't figure out how otherwise to do a collaboration. Like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine, well, I'll paint a little bit and you play a little music. And then from the music that I listened to, I'll paint a little more. I was like, that's so not gonna work for me. But on the other hand, when we started talking and he saw the painting and I'd, I'd heard a bunch of like, not entire long clips, but clips of his music and I really liked it. I just got very excited at the possibility of there being this kind of response, this synesthetic response, and that is what Montage Music Society stands for. So I'm very, very grateful that Deborah is gonna be our pianist. She's an amazing musician. Uh, Lori Carney is the violinist and she's also just great. I mean, all three of them are great musicians and you're in for a treat. So thank you so much for coming.
Thank you very much. Thank you. We, uh, <laughs> we are delighted to be here at the church. What a beautiful, gorgeous space you have, Eric and April, and what a, a gift for this community. It's, it's really very special and an honor to be here to perform. Um, we know uh, Montage Music Society, which has been in existence since 2004 and commissioning music inspired by visual arts since 2005. Um, we met April and Eric because of our mutual dear friend, Bruce Wolosoff, whose compositions Montage Music Society has proudly played and recorded and uh, even got nominated for Grammys um, with his incredible music. So I, uh, I got to know uh, April and Eric a little bit. And when um, we uh, decided to have another new commission uh, to come out of COVID and the pandemic, I contacted my good friend, Lori Carney, our violinist, to say, she, well, she and the American String Quartet are in residence at the Manhattan School of Music in New York, and do you know any young, brilliant young composers who are interested in writing about visual art? And she said, oh, do I have the right person for you? Uh, and she introduced me to Niles Luther, who for quite some time had been composing and uh, writing music for the artist Kehinde Wiley's international exhibitions. And, um, I liked Niles a great deal when I met him, um, very personable and obviously extremely talented. And uh, so we set about looking to uh, decide on an artist who we would like to, for Niles to uh, write about, write a piece of music. And um, uh, Niles had just done uh, music for a Kehinde Wiley exhibition in at the National uh, Gallery in London. And it was all very seascapes and dramatic symphonic music. And I couldn't think of anything else except April's paintings. <laughs> it was just uh, such a natural and what a treat for us that you said yes when I contacted you. And so we'll hear more about the evolution of light bending the world as a piece of music and uh, in April talking about her painting light bending the world and how the two of them came together um, in, in almost in tandem, in, but in a different kind of way. So uh, you can ask all kinds of questions and they can tell you about it. But first, uh, I will stop talking and uh, let you hear. Niles has a piece for cello and electronic um, music that is the very first piece of art music that he wrote. And he will tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll stop talking and get back to the music. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Deb. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Niles Luther. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just want to introduce the piece I'm about to play. It's called Desiderium. And um, as Deb mentioned, it's the first piece of uh, music that I've written in this genre that I'm calling art music, which is music that's specifically inspired by visual art. And this idea comes from the Greek tradition, this concept called ekphrasis, which is the attempt to transmedialize the narrative of a visual work into language. And it's used a lot in the poetics, so a poem of Mona Lisa, for instance, is an example of this. And I thought it would be beautiful to change the language of text or English into the language of music. So that's where the inspiration for art music comes from. And the painting that inspired this piece, Desiderium, was a painting that was given to me by my grandparents, by this American artist, Gino Hollander. And it's for uh, four young girls crying. And 
Um, it was sitting in my studio right in front of my piano, and I didn't really quite have a place to put it. And one day I was just sitting at the piano and I decided, I, I didn't even think, just some, some music, some notes came out of the piano and I decided, I'm gonna turn this into a full composition. So this, I feel, is the first true example of art music in this genre that I'm deeply passionate about. And the electronics that you're going to hear are, um, it's from a recording that I created for this composition, and it was written for two cellos, uh, piano, and orchestra. But what I've done is I've taken out the main solo cello voice in this recording. So I'll be playing that part while the rest of the instrumentation plays on these speakers behind me. Please enjoy.
Thank you, everyone. Um, we want to uh, welcome questions and, and observations from the audience. And uh, most of all, uh, let's start out with um, April and Niles and how they shared ideas to come up with this. April had thoughts about this painting. She had already started it when we came to visit. Well, it's, it's funny hearing this performance is quite different from the one in the inaugural one that was in the gallery. I think because the acoustics are different, I felt like there was greater, there was greater clarity <clears throat> for all the instruments, which was just thrilling. I mean, it's just, and then I was also thinking, I, I think I've mentioned that the title is Light Bending the World, but of course that title came much, much after the painting had been finished. I'm not a really good titler. I mean, I had lots of thoughts about it as I was working on it, but I started to feel like you anticipated <laughs> the, the kind of, um, the force of what that title is meant to convey, the, these, these big movements that are um, slow and um, complex. And also there is, such an amazing amount of coloration in your composition. It's so, it's so brilliantly colored. And for me, this was a very, very um, luxuriously colored painting. I don't always use so many colors in, in such uh, a kind of an abandon. I don't know how else to put it, but you know, I, I, I've done a lot of paintings that are much more restrained and much more limited palette, so. I wanted to make this painting. I wanted to make it rich and sonorous and slow and with you know a certain amount of speed in various parts of it. And it seemed like, especially as I was listening tonight, it was all in the music, all, all, all. It was kind of astonishing that way. Um, that's beautiful. I think that you gave me so much to work with. I mean, <laughs> like, it, within the painting. There are so many, I felt, different vignettes, different scenes to pull from, different emotional um, characters that are represented in the color. And I, when I sat down to write the music, my intent was solely to provide a faithful representation of what that would translate into with music. So really, I feel more of like a craftsman or like a um, translator, like a linguist, trying to take what I see, what you present me, and like all the content that's there, all the passion and the soul you have that you pour into the canvas, and try and faithfully recreate that within music. I, I think that it's it's altogether something new and broader and different, and in your language, I mean, then it's the untranslatable aspect of translation, yeah. surely, because there's, there's so much in this piece that's, that's alike and also different, like yeah. necessarily, and then the, the where you go yeah. in this piece is different from, it's not, yeah. you know, representation, yeah. it's certainly not illustrative in any way, yeah. but um, I, it's so moving to me, I, and the, the, um, you three musicians playing together is like absolutely orchestral. I mean, it's such a rich piece and you're all such brilliant, brilliant performers that the dimensionality of your performance is such that I felt like I was, I was just going, I, like the world was growing and, and then collapsing and then growing, I mean, it was just spectacular that way. I don't know how, do you enjoy are you enjoying playing in this room? <laughs> I hope, yeah. Fantastic space. I keep wondering if maybe something about all this old wood, which we've all, we've talked about this before, that it um, is all 300 years old and all this rosin is crystallized and this kind of an amplifier effect that the, the building itself has, has generously and surprisingly given us as a performance space, which was not something that we thought about at all. We just thought, that old wood is so cool. I don't want to touch any of it. Let's leave it all where it is. When we saw it all stripped down, 
And thanks to Lee and Eric and you know a million conversations, we've managed to pull this off. But but one unintended, but you know, for a consequence for which I'm very grateful is that it's also this amazing place to hear music and um, this piece in particular, like the colors just go with, I keep thinking of it as being this incredibly colorful piece tonight particularly, like it's just like really hitting me. Yeah, I think I think definitely the space, we, we debuted this at Miles McHenry Gallery, April's Gallery in Chelsea. And um, I think here the space is so fitting because when I think of uh, a church, right? Um, this kind of sacred element to it, of course, that was like the roots of this building. And for me, and I know we talked about this last year, um, nature uh, has also this kind of sacred component to it as well. Absolutely. So yeah. to pair this music with this painting within the space, the sacred space of a church, um, I think uh, it's very well, very well put together in that regard. Yeah. Um, I, would you like to say anything? I, I just wanted to say that frequently you'll come into a space like this and you think, oh, we really need the audience to, uh, s to warm up the sound um, because there's always a fear that it's going to be too live. But the wood enriches the sound. It's, it's really, it gives a warmth to the sound that is such fun to work with. Um, just, I feel that we could hear each other really well, but also just do so many more things with the music than we had even thought of before. Mm -hmm. Well, if you'd like to come back and compose something for the church, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, should we open it? I would love to know how people felt listening to this. I'd heard a lot after the concert at Miles's gallery, and it was wonderful. But I that was after the fact, and I'd wish that I'd we'd opened it up to mm -hmm. people's questions afterwards. If you have any remarks or um, comments or anything, I'd oh Ada, hi, how are you? Incredible to listen. Take, Whoops. The, take the mic. Because I always was thinking, how can we only see paintings? I had to talk right into the, the top of the mic. It was incredible to listen to that because I always going to galleries was wondering why they don't play music. Because it's not sufficient to hit us on, on one feeling. It has to be synergy with something. And when I was looking at your painting, I felt so connected to that because... Yeah of the music was in synergy with your painting. And I'm wondering now, next time when you're painting, it's like writing a song. You first write the music, you find somebody to write lyrics for you. Let's say you finish your painting, you're looking at it, and then wouldn't you go through a lot of music which comes to your mind in combination with the musicians, and finally you find something and say, that's it. And because that keeps you standing in front of your painting longer and feeling it because otherwise people just pass by with no feelings and you stay only for five minutes and it stays with you. I am just so pleased because I've been so long thinking about why they don't play music in the galleries, why they just, everybody shuts up and just walks around through the music and don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's your solution. <laughs> it's funny, I. Speaking of that, like when I'm when I'm painting, a lot of the time, and not to sound like a goofball artist, but a lot of the time when I'm working in my studio, I don't think to myself, that yellow is not quite right. I think that yellow is too fast. I've got to slow it down somehow. Or I think um, like I the the surface of water is not sheer and fast enough. Like I think about tempo in the way that I build these paintings up and make them, you know, for me work. And it's, you know, so it's something that I, I love that thought, exactly what you're expressing, that, that anything that could slow people down. And they're slow paintings. They're not um, quick Instagram, you know, images, everything, things that are, are meant to like flash like slides before your eyes. I mean, I want people to live with them and 
contemplate them, like like spend some time. They're meant to have enough stuff in them <laughs> that it's worth doing that. And I, I would just love to comment on that point and the point you brought up. Um, I think just listening to you speak made me think about like the kind of opposite uh, problems we have to tackle as a painter and the composer, specifically as it relates to time and uh, permanence. And a painting is this vision that you have that's captured in time, it's like pressed into time, and it's permanent. And like you had mentioned, you are thinking of tempo, you're thinking of rhythm, because bringing movement to an image that's pressed in time can be a challenge, I, I believe. But with music, there's almost this opposite problem, which is we do not have permanence, like the music is already gone now. And however, there is a tremendous amount of movement in the music, it flows, it, it can breathe. So trying to have that sense of permanence, have the music affect you in such a way that you can leave the space with a feeling of being permanently changed, I think that um, is well, the aim. You, you, what you what you lose in permanence, you gain in experience. Yeah. So that once you've experienced a piece of music and it, it kind of fills you up from different directions, especially mm -hmm. in this rich piece of music that you wrote, you do get this kind of ac accumulated, you know, recent past, very recent mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that um, a lot of the power in the music and also the way that you repeat themes is mm -hmm. so carefully done mm -hmm. and it's so, they're so beautifully rendered. They they pile up in your soul. In the, <laughs> that was in the goal. Way. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Hi. Hi. First, I just have to say what we're all thinking, which is that you are a brilliant composer. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. And. and you obviously have a love affair with harmony. I mean, in Desiderium, uh, such rich, mellifluous kind of uh, flowing harmonies. Uh, when we were designing this space, I knew that it would be the fourth instrument. And when I was sitting here, I felt like the space, the wood, of course, but the volume and the, the surfaces uh, were part of the composition that was, was really very gratifying for me. But I do have a question for you. Sure. And that is, um, as an interpreter, when you're doing art music, art composing, are you thinking of it in the sense that, like, program music was written, like Sanson or Mazorsky or Debussy, or is it a different kind of interpretation, not... It's not literal, obviously, as, as April said, but it's but it's based on something. You know, you said something a minute ago, which got me really excited. Like, could you write music of a piece of architecture? I I believe so. I mean, first of all, that's a very well get ready for a commission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, I think that. You know, like when I sit down to write, it's not really this intellectual like process of, oh, let me try and do X, Y, and Z. It's more just, I take my musical tools at my disposal. Usually it's my cello and I'm just looking at the work and trying to turn off the ego mm -hmm. so that I'm just a vessel channeling whatever my vision is, um, you know, whatever's flowing through my eyes, you know? And, there's this idea that like uh, we all have our own interpretation of reality by way of which we see and all of our experiences slightly color our vision and what we interpret is a result of our experiences up until that point in life. So like I can't say for certain that what I see even now is objective, mm -hmm. but when I look at a work, all I'm trying to do is try and recreate the way it makes me feel. And I would hope that that is a representation, at least in some part, of the, the work. But I'm not sitting down to think like, oh, in terms of program music, I, a sunset sounds like this, so I have to <laughs> play in G major. It's more just like, what is the spirit of the work? And can I 
do my best to try and capture that. That's great. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, Niles, I was just curious why you chose to start the repertory this evening with Mendelssohn before your own work? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, this was a group decision. Do one of you want to speak to that? Sure. Uh, I had asked Niles way back what, uh, who, who did he, uh, what composers, what types of music influenced him? Um, and he said, uh, you know, uh, early, uh, well, late classical, early romantic um, composers, and Mendelssohn was one of the composers he had mentioned. And um, in, uh, so we all love this particular movement of the, the D minor piano trio of Mendelssohn. And uh, so we chose that to open this program in the way of an influence. And then uh, we had actually thought about something French for a second piece, but then um, I remembered this piece that, that Niles had sent me um, of his first piece of art music, so that's what came next. And I would suggest that the next time Desiderium is performed that you, we, we could have projected the, the painting. We were, we were literally thinking about that just before like 10 minutes before the concert, but I wasn't sure if I had the rights to do that. Of with course, no, we're, we're yeah. chill here. Well, I, I didn't want to offend the artist's estate and oh. she... she <laughs> oh, the artist's estate. Yeah, so, yeah, the, yeah. so Gino Hollander's uh, daughter, Siri Hollander, is an artist, and I reached out to her to get her permission to write, to compose this piece of music. This was last year um, for Desiderium, so I didn't want to... <laughs> do project something without getting her permission first, mm -hmm. so. Well, next time. I yeah, mean, because it is it is fascinating to, to add and subtract your own yeah. emotions mm -hmm. to what you're looking at and listening to. Totally. There was a question right there, yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you, and you are a beautiful composer, but, uh, and I love the fact that you pointed out that you saw vignettes in, in April's piece and, uh, you know, a, a, a piece of art is one part and music is another and the two together always enhance each other, which is what's so beautiful when music is played to a visual piece. But now I'm looking at April's painting going, is the clearing first or is the storm first? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have thought that if I hadn't listened to your music take us through this journey, which, you know, halfway through got dangerous, and then it settled, and I'm looking at it going, yeah, wait a minute, is the storm coming or is the clearing coming? So that's kind of my comment. Well, I was actually thinking, to your point, I was actually thinking um, about um, Beethoven's pastoral the sixth symphony you know where he literally you know like there's birds and then there's clouds come and then there's rain and i mean boom it's it's he does a whole storm thing and then it clears up and you you can go home now <laughs> but it's i mean this is so different from that it's so much more emotionally complex and it, there's certainly a lot of emotion and gorgeous beauty and the sixth symphony don't get me wrong but it's a different kind of trajectory and I, your question about whether you know what's happening first there that's exactly the question and there will never be an answer so I like the fact in your music that you have it you have a certain kind of emotional complexity that is suspended that becomes suspended because of the complexity of it because it it comes it goes it comes it goes yeah. and you, you don't really you don't get to settle into it, but that to me makes it more real and more um, contem contemplatively engaging. Mm. I, I felt that, and I think also for me, like that concept of that duality, I felt the same way when I was looking at this painting, like is it sunrise, is it sunset, like what time of day is it, like has the storm come, is it, has it gone, and I feel that like when, when I was writing the piece of music, um, 
I wrote the scherzo, which was like the big fiery section, and it would be very easy to end the piece right. at the end of the scherzo, which is like this big finale, blah, 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 applause. But I felt like that wasn't an honest representation of like how I felt, which is like caught in between this twilight area. And T.S. Eliot has this quote from the Four Quartets, and the quote is, um, at the still point, they're the dances. And I felt that that's what I was trying to navigate this in between this uh, dual sense of being where you're trying to figure out who are you within a uh, duplicitous space. Yeah. And then also, I would add that this is a, this is kind of a pandemic painting for me. Sure. And there was, there was so much pain during that time. There was so much loss. There was so much beauty. And there were so many unexpected moments of whatever, like a high irony where you find yourself laughing at the thing that's scaring you to your own surprise because that's more real than just being overwhelmed by it. I mean, that, that there's like a next day after the day that you just thought you were just gonna lose it. So trying to build all that kind of complexity in is much more interesting to me, mm -hmm. to your point. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, anyone else have a question, comment? Uh, I, uh, this is uh, uh, about uh, Laurie's violin. Um, I, I was struck by the softness, uh, uh, the the sort of lower tone of it. I don't know if that's the playing of it or the instrumentation, you know, the instrument itself. But I was wondering also when you were writing the, writing the piece, because the, the cello and the violin go so amazing together, in that softer tone, yeah. whether you knew Laurie's playing <laughs> and were kind of thinking of that as a thing or it was just a wonderful coincidence that, uh, that you coupled it. Well, Laurie and I go way back. <laughs> she, was, she actually taught me chamber music in my undergrad and she t coached me on the Mendelssohn that we played, like, what was that, seven years ago? Yeah. So I know her playing very, very well. I would go to, uh, she's in the American String Quartet there in residence at Manhattan School of Music. So every semester I was going to those concerts and was very intimately familiar with her sound. So when I sat down to write, compose the piece, there were so many sections where I was like, had a very clear concept, especially because of her violin, which is a gorgeous instrument, um, what it would sound like uh, to come out of her violin with her playing as opposed to, um, like another young musician like myself with a young instrument. Um, so there's like a richness in this in the slower movement. Um, there's this like really slow melody that we trade back and forth. The piano gets it first, then the violin, and finally the cello gets it last. But I knew it would sound rich and chocolatey on in that register when Laurie would play it. So um, this. It's, by the way, a beautiful room to play in. And you were talking about April, 300-year-old wood. Well, this violin is 303 years old, so I think it feels, uh -huh. feels very... That's a throwdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 303 years old. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I will say, too, that um, one of the best musical performance satisfactions of my whole life was listening to montage music when you first performed Bruce's pieces because the the synchrony of all the musicians and it's it was so true tonight too I mean it's so synchronous there's something so deeply empathetic about about everyone is making the music happen and there's no grandstanding and there's it's just beautifully beautifully Sorry, I can't think of a better word, but it's so unified um, in an extraordinary way. And I feel like everything is, it's, it's felt knitted, knit together evenly in some way that was, um, that sounds flat. It was exhilarating. It was very, very exhilaratingly beautiful. I have to say, I've worked with many, many composers over the years. And... Um, 
Niles is probably one of the most talented and young composers. Most, most composers don't make their mark in the world until they're, you know, 35, 40. Um, and, um, and he knows what he wants. That's, that's the other thing. A lot of young composers don't really know what they want and they're experimenting. Uh, but the privilege of playing a piece like this is the composer's right there. You can ask him anything you want and get an answer. <laughs> unlike, unlike all the great old quartets that we play most of the time. I would think that everybody's wondering if they can listen to this piece again in recorded fashion, and if so, where? Well, this, uh, this will be thanks to our friends at Vision Maker Productions who have been taping tonight. Um, we, will have, uh, we will have this performance on YouTube in, we hope, a few weeks. And you'll be able to watch it and listen to it again. And uh, if you're in Santa Fe on November 11th, we're, <laughs> we're playing it there. And we will play it as much as we possibly can. It, it's worthy and deserves to be played and, and heard by many people. Yeah. And then when is your next uh, work with Kehinde Wiley? So I don't, I'm not sure what Kehinde is up to these days. We kind of did that last project in um, 2021 and we haven't worked on anything since. I've definitely pivoted more at, like out of the art film genre and specifically into art music. So I have some exciting things coming up. Nothing I can announce right now, but Stay tuned. All right. And do you have a do you have a news newsletter or website or something that people can or no Insta? Newsletter. Are you on Insta? I'm on Insta, I'm on Twitter, um, but my website has all of my information, NilesLuther.com. So you can see me there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Thank you so much. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So nice. Just, to see you. you guys are just brilliant. <laughs>